All right, so we're going to shift gears a little bit uh, to go to the next level, which is we have this uh, experience with JSON, which is a storage and an interchange format for data. Um, it's a building block. Therefore, various groups have built upon it then to go to the next level, which is to make it work and feel much more like a real database. And so we're going to get to now uh, a big concept that will uh, enhance our app, which is the ability to use sort of a much more real database. So I've been mentioning this before, and now we'll look at it in more detail. Let's open up your web browser and let's go to pouchdb.com. Pouchdb.com. Pouchdb the database that syncs. PouchDB is an open source JavaScript database inspired by Apache CouchDB that is designed to run well within the browser. PouchDB was created to help web developers build apps that work as well offline as they do online. It enables apps to store data locally while offline and then synchronize, to, synchronize with CouchDB and compatible servers when the app is back online, keeping the user's data in sync no matter where they next log in. So with local storage, remember when we talked about local storage, that's a way to save pretty permanent data, um, but that's only really saving it to your device. What we want is something that is more robust, like a real app, whereas let's say I have uh, I have my old um, my old phone, you know, some LG whatever phone, and I had Instagram on it. I created an account. I have my pictures and all of that. Then I get a brand new phone. I get the brand new Motorola Moto G4, and I want to use Instagram again. I don't want it to have me create a brand new account because I've got a brand new device. I want my uh, data from the old device to come to the new device. Behind the scenes, there's a server infrastructure of Instagram where everything that you've done and saved is getting backed up, basically, to the Instagram servers so that when you go to another device and you log in with your credentials, that data follows you to your new device. So this is going to be something that goes toward that. At the minimum, we will be able to create databases and do all of the basic operations of a database. And it'll save to whatever device you're working on. Whenever we get back to uh, Taco, this will work with our Taco Run browser. This will work with Taco Emulate Android. And this, of course, will work with Taco Run Android. It'll work with a real Android device, a real iPhone device, Windows Phone, whatever. It's a database that'll work on any device, JavaScript-based. But we'll see also that it can synchronize to a server. Now, spoiler alert, I have to say now, we're not going to get to the part about the server stuff, because this requires that you have a server. You have some place with a compatible server where you can save your data to. Uh, I'm 99% sure we're not going to get to that. Maybe we will. Most likely we, we won't. But at the very least, what we'll have is an app that can save any amount of data to the device permanently, uh, you close the app, you shut down the app, you force quit it, whatever, you load it up, all the data is still there in the app of that device. Yes, then the perfect scenario would be that then if you move from this device to the new device that the data follows you, but that requires the server infrastructure. And that's always the issue regarding these modern apps. You can use all your skills to make a great app, but all of that advanced stuff really relies on a server, on infrastructure if there was, I suppose, a part four of this class. That's when we would spend time to work with all of that, and that's when we'd have to invest in servers and bandwidth and all like that. For us then, um, if we look here, this is the way that it works. Here's a very simple code snippet. We have var db. That's just like JavaScript, because it is JavaScript. Create a variable called db, and then instantiate a new object of pouchdb. Uh, we're going to have something that is the pouchdb object. We'll create a new one. 
with a database name, anything we want. And then we'll have db.put. Well, we have the db object which we've just created here. Once we've created that, it has various methods. Creating a new pouch object gives us methods, which we'll, we'll look what they are here, of course. One of them is put. Put something into the database. And this should look familiar here. JSON formatted data. Curly brace. Key value, key value, key value. Now I have, because this is open source, the people that run this, you know, there's a, a lot of people that, that help make this project. It's not one company that invented it and puts it out there proprietary. It's open source. Anyone can, can contribute. So I've spoken with the people that run this and I've contributed here and there and I've told them um, you should update this to make it obvious that it's JSON because what's slightly different than what we've been talking about? We have key value pairs, yes, but what's been different than what we've been doing so far? Double quotes. These are single quotes. Single quotes. These should be double quotes. And the key, or the name, should also be in double quotes. It's forgiving, and it'll work as it has it here. But other parts of the documentation do have the double quotes. So I suggested, hey guys, remember to put this in fully JSON format on your home page. And I said, great, you know, go into our GitHub and help us fix it. I haven't gotten around to it, but uh, hopefully someone will. The point is that's JSON data, isn't it? Some key, colon, some value, comma, another key, another value, comma, and then the last one. So into the database, put an object, put a record of a person's ID, in this case an email, their name, first name, and then an age, a number, because it's not in, in quotes. There's a method called changes built into the specification, which we can of course read in the documentation. There's a way to check, have there been changes made to the database? Uh, so very simply check on change. We've had on click before. Um, we have other things here specifically on change. Has there been a change to the database somehow, some, some, some time? If there has been, then do something about it and simply just a little console output. There have been changes to the database. Obviously here, within this anonymous function, we can have a variety of other uh, methods or call a named function to have it do 10 things. And then we've also got another method of replicate. Replicate to my server. My current database state replicated to a server. This is very simple here. It doesn't mention anything about authentication and such, passwords and such, which we are able to do and we should do, of course. But here, very simply, then we've got some data in the database. Let's go save it to the online, the online um, version of it. And then I believe we have the opposite, which is replicate from, give me the data from the database and put it into my current version of the app. So we can have data synchronized back and forth between days of time and devices. I'm moving from, a, from an Android phone to an iPhone or vice versa, but I've got all of this on a server, it'll follow me. So it goes on to say it's uh, cross-browser, works on all the browsers and of course on mobile devices. Lightweight, easy to learn, open source, the latest version, Pouch 5.4.0 just came out recently. So it's it's been updating for a while. I've, I've been using this solution in this version of the class that I've been teaching for about three years now. I've seen it evolving and evolving and getting better speedier, more robust and such, because there's many ways, there's many answers to this problem. I want to save data to a database. There's many solutions. Here's one possible solution. Is it the best one for every use case? Maybe not, but it's a very good one for what we want to do in our app. We can go to the mailing list we can go check on Stack Overflow for other people working on it. We can contact directly the developers. We can go submit a, uh, an error, you know, a, what do they call it, a, 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 t 
ticket to tell them there's a there's a bug in the software or if I know enough I could fix the bug and since it's open source let that then populate to to everyone as that I've contributed to this where I've helped improve the the project um, let's look at um, let's look at guides this is an overview about what is it it's an implementation of CouchDB, what's CouchDB, you can click and follow that um, it's a JavaScript library also, what's the difference, blah 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 um, just goes on to say that what is it, how do you set it up, how does it work, there will be examples of code let's say I go setting, well I'm going to skip setting up couch again that requires a server, I'm going to go setting up pouch, basically the way you can access all of this all of these database features, it's just a reference to a JavaScript library. Either a local JavaScript file in your project, in your WW folder, or an online version in their, in their CDN. So in a moment we'll download that and we'll work with it. Different ways to work with it. Bower, NPN, there's the CDN. So basically you just add this JavaScript reference to your code plus the file or the CDN version. How does it work? Working with it, we've seen here. We're going to use this. One of the very first things is, well, we're going to create a database. We create a JavaScript variable, uh, make it an instance of the pouch DB object, call that whatever we want, like we'll make a brand new database called kittens. doesn't matter what we call it, we can create as many as we want. Within the documentation here, we will see the size and limits of these databases depending on the device, but it's a very generous size for databases. It should, it should satisfy just about everyone. And we can create multiple databases. So let's say we have a limit of 100 megabytes for this database. Well, that's still a very big database. We can create multiple ones. We can create a database called kittens, and another one called cats, and another one called tigers. And all of those could be 100 megabytes. We can save a lot of data. Etc. Okay, well, how do you then create one on a server? Very, very similar. You just point it to your server running the appropriate software and it creates your database on your server. Etc. And basically, we're going to be seeing JSON over and over. You can verify that your database is working by visiting your address. And you should see something like this it'll give you back. A response, a JSON object with these keys and values. It'll tell you your database name is this, comma, doc count. There's this number of documents in there. Uh, how many times has it been updated? All of this stuff, the data size, etc. You can get back some error responses. And again, the whole point of us talking about JSON is that so many modern frameworks and data-driven websites, data depositories, now have adopted the JSON format. We can go look up the Twitter documentation to be able to create a Twitter app. And Twitter will spit back, if you request something, Twitter will spit back JSON data to you. That then you can process with JavaScript and display in HTML and style with CSS. It's just data, simple text that then we work with to refine it. We'll do this stuff as we go on, debugging, we'll use our developer's console, deleting, updating, etc., working with documents. So PouchDB is a NoSQL database, meaning that you store unstructured documents rather than explicitly specifying a schema with rows, tables, and all of that. And it looks like this, JSON. So in this case, the documentation has the quotes. The home page should have the quotes. And so we've got underscore ID, mittens, name, mittens, occupation, kitten, age, three, hobbies, and then more 
data here, playing with balls of yarn, chasing regular pointers, looking hella cute. So all of that is one document, that is one record. Different databases give it different names, and notice here it shows you, well, if you're used to SQL, there's no actual equivalent of table, but you can think of it as a bundle of data. A row is one document, that up there is one document, it's a row. A column in SQL would be a, uh, would be a, a field which is like hobbies. Primary key is always underscore ID. You will see that whatever data we create, we always have to have an underscore ID. That's how, that's how all our data is differentiated. We'll see that in a bit. Index is a lead. We'll get into that in detail. Notice what it's done here. Var, doc, um, putting it in JSON uh, format. All of that's being stored in a, in a variable of doc. And then uh, db.put. Put that doc with all of its data into my database. Easy as that. We've created the database, putting data into the database, <coughs> getting data from the database, dot get. A database, you want to get something from the database. Well, that's where that important ID comes in. Every uh, document that we upload, every bundle of data, needs to have an ID to differentiate it. Nothing else in my database can have an ID of mittens, it has to have a different name, which makes sense. If you try to create an account, on Facebook, and you're trying to use an email address that already exists, it won't let you. It says, pick another email. Someone else already has that email. You can't use it on Facebook. Some piece of data has to be unique throughout Facebook so that there isn't, you know, cross collisions of data. So Pouch uses the reserved key of ID, underscore ID. So then when we need to retrieve the information, we, we use an ID, mittens, get, <coughs> if we're getting it, then do something with that data, that doc, simply here, show, give me console log output, and it'll just spit back everything that we've put into it before. Although, little typo there. Oh no, sorry, they have it backwards. Mittens and mittens. Yeah. It'll, re it'll return all your data, tell you what you wrote, it'll give you back, here's your ID, and a revision field. Because the basic operations of a database would be to store data, retrieve data, update data, Maybe the name, uh, maybe the age of that kitten needs to be changed. That kitten isn't going to be three years old forever. Eventually, it's going to be a new age. And so, we would need to update this document, this record, and so, that there is, so that there aren't conflicts in the data. There is a revision ID here, or a random string of data, to prevent collisions in your data. That'll make sense later goes on to explain what rev is. <clears throat> if you're trying to update documents without properly giving it a new revision, you'll get an error, meaning you know, you're not doing it right. And it goes on to tell you here how to do it. We'll do it ourselves. And we'll have version 2 of the data. That'll increment as many times as we want. It'll go on to get and put, deleting, updating, etc. Bulk operations, updating, deleting, get and put, deleting data, Deleting a record or a document is 
basically DB got removed, required, or what document are you trying to remove, and optionals are options and a callback. Throughout the documentation here, we will see different ways to implement our code. We will see the classic callback method, which um, relies a bit more on if-else statements, which we've worked with before. Another method, which is via promises. And then asynchronous functions. So these are three ways to do the same thing. We've been learning a bit more via callbacks. We also got promises, quick show of hands. How many of, of you in, in JavaScript have ever dealt with promises in JavaScript? So we're not really going to use them here either. It's a new thing to kind of um, learn to implement. So we'll be, we'll be using what we used a bit before with callbacks because that's what we see with Cordova. Remember with Cordova, let's say we had the camera API. We had uh, something like camera.getPicture, whatever it was. And then we had either camera success, comma, camera fail. Those were callback functions. So we will use that same idiom in uh, checking the documentation. So when you look this up yourself, if you want to further learn, I would recommend whenever there's any examples of code, have it on callbacks because that's going to be reminiscent of what we've already dealt with. If you're looking at promises, it's a different kind of idiom than we've dealt with in class. And on and on. We're not going to look at every single thing here. We're, we're going to get pretty hands-on very, very quickly. But here's our idea. We're going to use the PouchDB database, which is basically a JavaScript library. We're going to use reminiscent code. JavaScript code, and behind the scenes it'll all just work. We just then need to write the, the JavaScript code to create databases, create documents, store documents, retrieve documents, delete documents, update documents, all the basic operations of any database. But we're doing this because it's self-contained. We will be able to add it to our app without any server infrastructure. And if we had server infrastructure, we would be able to replicate our data from device to device. So any general questions with PouchDB? Yes? So this is all JSON, but you can only store us data, right? You can't store it in front of it, right? You could. You could create a, a key called photo. And then in the photo field here, you could store, you know, uh, like 64-bit encoded Data. If you convert your picture to, you know, textual data, you can store it that way. You most likely, however, should store a reference to a picture on the memory card instead of the whole raw picture in the database, which is exactly what we did when we were working with our project here. We didn't actually store the data of the picture in JSON. We stored a location, a reference to it. But if we wanted to in pouch, we could store the raw data of the picture in pouch. If we do that, then we have that issue perhaps that you're having a bit that you can't access that picture from any other app. Because this is going to be similar to local storage in that what we create here is really only accessible by that app. It's going to be sandboxed to that app. Is there a size and value? It is device related. Somewhere here it'll tell you, it'll tell us what, uh, it'll tell us somewhere here, probably in facts, uh, some sizes, like right here, how much data can it store. In Firefox, uh, it has no upper limit. If your app has to store more than 50 megs, it will ask the user. Chrome determines the amount based on their hard drive. So. Uh, if we're on an Android device, which says down here, I believe Android works the same as Chrome. So if you've got if you've got an, a newer Android device, basically the the limit of how much you can store is how much space they have on their device. If it's an older version of Android, it can store up to 200 megs. Which if it's just going to be text data, that's a lot of data. If it's going to be pointers, 
to pictures on a memory card, that's a lot of storage. If you're storing your raw picture data in the database, then yes, you're going to run out of data rather quickly when people keep snapping photos. But depending, iOS, so mobile safari for example seems to be in increments of five megs at a time it'll confirm with the user would you like to increase the size of your database again five megabytes of just text data in a database is still a lot of data any other questions before we get started Yes. Yes, but also think about it if, uh, if I have a phone and I have Instagram and I take 10 pictures every day, I'm going to run out of space anyway too on my device from Instagram. And any of my devices, if I'm saving the data to my device, I'm going to run out of storage on my device no matter the app. Those other apps, however, have the uh, infrastructure of that Instagram photo got saved to the Instagram server. That Facebook photo got saved to the Facebook server. This, if we have the server infrastructure, we take that photo, we save it to the database on our server, and right there we'll have a terabyte of storage. Yes, basically, that's that's going to be up to that's going to be up to us. But yes, as we create our PouchDB objects, we will have these links, these references to our data on the server, where we've parsed or we've given amount of space for every user. We're going to give every user one gigabyte of, sto of picture storage because I'm going to pay for that amount of storage on my server. So yes, on the one hand, it looks like well, five megabytes of data. That's barely one picture. Yes, if we only deal with our app on the device, if we have that whole server infrastructure, we don't quite have that limit. So what we need to do then is we need to download or use the CDN version, but we'll download it because eventually we want to add this to our project and not rely on an internet connection. So at the very top right, you should see the download button. Go ahead and click that. That'll take you over to the download. And what we want is the pouch to be compressed. You should see download pouch 545 min.js, the minified production version. Uh, you should probably right click that and select to save. I forgot to say, we need to, we're going to work on a sort of standalone pouch project for a moment, so that's going to be in its own folder. I'm going to save that file to my flash drive. In my flash drive, I will create a brand new pouch working project. Yes. Go ahead and download the. Um, that pouch file and I'm going to save it to a folder on my flash drive called my, my pouch file. Whatever. We're going to save it somewhere on our flash drive. Make sure it's saving the pouch 545 min.js file. Leave this window open for... Well, I guess we don't really need it open. But uh, we need to download that file. I've downloaded it to my flash drive. We're going to start with an empty HTML file. So in my uh, flash drive, I've saved the pouch file. We're going to create a new index.html file here in Notepad, and we're going to do the, the usual 10-line simple file. Or if you have that simple 10-line file saved somewhere, make a copy of it. So in Notepad, 
case I don't have a copy of it, so I'll have to do it again quickly here. I need to do this again. I'm going to focus on pouch, so we'll need just a very basic... We'll integrate it into our app a little later. We want to make sure this works without the distractions of the other parts of our project. Our usual 10 lines. We've had some practice with that. If you don't have it, we'll get together quickly. Hmm. What I want to do also is uh, okay, so we, um, we're going to be using jQuery and Pouch. So we're going to need to write some script references. Now uh, we need to go retrieve our jQuery library in a moment. And then we will need to reference the pouch library which we just put into the folder. What's it called again? Pouch. project or the network folder somewhere. Go get the, J the jQuery, just the jQuery, we don't need the jQuery mobile. Get the jQuery JS file and put it into this folder and then write the reference to that file. We're going to need jQuery. We don't need jQuery but it's very useful. Obviously on line 10, I have a reference to my pouch file that I downloaded. Of course, this index file is being saved in the same folder as my pouch DB file or folder. And I will go over to the network folder and I can find somewhere in there the jQuery file. So it should be under the network folder. Android, we can get it out of the latest version of my SDCE, which is 719, www, um, jQuery, copy jQuery into my project folder. No, we only need the jQuery JS file. We don't need the jQuery mobile files yet. We've got our basic HTML file, and then we need to write in line 9. Notice the order in that jQuery first and then pouch, because oftentimes jQuery is this foundational library that will be used by many other things. That should be that. Let's 
get a moment to do that. This shouldn't be anything new. This just references to a couple of JavaScript libraries. One of them is PouchDB. Nothing special happens if you run this. Um, this one, we're going to be running this. I, we're getting, we're going to get better results as we're testing this in Chrome. It shouldn't really matter, but we will see why because we'll be able to see the data in the database a little easier in Chrome. So if you run this, nothing special should happen. You shouldn't get any errors. If you get errors, well, fix them. There's nothing complex that should be going wrong at the moment. There's our project so far. So the concept is that this uh, this will be integrated into our app and what I want to do with our app is well we're doing we're building the unofficial my SDCE app. And what I want people to be able to do is for them to save a list like a class schedule, a list of classes that they've taken or are going to take you know, like a checklist of classes toward their major. You know, they, I want people to save a, a, an educational plan. And so our classes are made up of bits of data. Uh, who's teaching the class? An instructor. Um, a title of the class. A uh, CRN number. When I, when I gave you guys the add codes, well, you've got a field here called CRN. Every class is differentiated with a CRN number. And so we're going to save those and perhaps more bits of data into Pouch. So that's how we're going to use Pouch here. We could, of course, further use it to store pictures. or Let's say we wanted to set it up so that our app also allows the user to take a photo of something and save it in the database. And so we will have some, uh, some user input. We will have a way for people to input their classes and the instructor and all of that good stuff. So we will build that in the body after H1. We're going to create a form, not forum, but a form. Input boxes, basically. We're going to create input boxes to have the user input various bits of data. Now eventually we'll, we're going to need this so we'll just add it right away just so that we don't forget. We'll go back to the form and we'll give it a unique ID. We want to be able to reference it via JavaScript easier or via CSS to style it. So we'll give it an ID. Y as opposed to a class doesn't quite matter. It's just some way to reference that form. ID of course uh, assumes that it's you've got one of these forms, and I'm going to call it form class. This is an input for class information, and I'm prefixing it with form. We're going to create an input box to store the to store the the name uh, to store the class data. Now, as we saw in the documentation of Pouch, there has to be an ID. There has to be one item in our JSON object of ID to differentiate all records, all documents. So we will be using the CRN number of a class. This Android class has a particular CRN number that no other class has. So eventually we're going to be using that as the unique identifier. We will create an input, an input element where a person can type in some text, so its attribute is of type text. 
This will be a text box. Unique ID so that via JavaScript, what the person types, we want to retrieve and store in the database. So via an ID would be a way that we can quickly retrieve that. We'll call this um, CRN field. This field here is for the CRN, the unique identifier of the class. You save and run this. Just looks like that, a box. Not a very good box. The user doesn't know what it does. So what we'll do in backup here is we'll add a uh, we'll add another uh, attribute here, placeholder. Not sure if I mentioned this one previously. This is a way for us to put in a little placeholder text in that box to guide people what to type here. Unless we program the a way to capture the data that we want, anything can be typed here. It's a type of text, but numbers could go here too and symbols and all of that. So if I use a placeholder, this is a part of a way to convince people how to type something here. So a CRN number looks something like this. It's in the format of four numbers and a letter. And that is just so that it'll show here. What do I type in that box? Oh, a CRN that looks like that. Obviously, then the person can type their own CRN number there or anything they want because we have not set it to only accept certain data. I want to display on screen to the user what should you be typing there. That's the CRN. Field. So before that input field, we'll type uh, CRN colon. I'll be telling you, here we're typing your CRN. Better way to do this is that we semantically link this text with that input field. Right now, there really isn't a relationship between this text and that input field. So we have a tag that we can use to create that relationship. It's called the label uh, tag. So we'll wrap a label, label tag. It has a pair. This is a label for that input field, so it needs an attribute so that it it knows, and it's the attribute exactly known as for. This label is for something. It's for that CRN field. This has the ID of CRN field, but this label doesn't quite recognize it. Label works with the name attribute, so actually to the input field, we've got an ID and we should also add the name attribute so that then that field is linked to this label. This label is being used for that field and the way we accomplish that is with name equals CRN field. You can use the same one. Now we've got something visual for the user, something semantic to be processed. That label is attached to this input field as a name. You can use the same name here. This is all right. This is two different things. One is ID, one is name. Placeholder. Placeholder text. If you save and run this, you should see your CRN text appear on screen. Next to it will be the input box. We 
We're going to create two more fields very similar to this. We'll save ourselves a lot of effort if you copy that line and paste it. Because next what we need to capture is the, um, the name of the class. So again, this will be hard to show. It's a big line, so I'll try to zoom in a bit. The next thing we're, we're capturing instead of Sierra, this will be class name. We're going to ask for a class name. We're going to need to change this label is now for class field. This ID will be class field. This name will be class field. It's still a type text. Some other placeholder, like an example name of a class. class field. We'll use the same one for name and the same one for ID. Example of a placeholder then is Android 1. We won't worry too much about the design of this thing yet. We really shouldn't at this point. The beauty of HTML-powered apps is that we've got, remember, the, um, the content layer, the presentation layer, the behavior layer. We've got the code HTML, which is all about its structure. We've got the CSS, which is all about the design. And we've got the JavaScript, which is all about the interaction. So don't worry that it's like this. You can put it in your own lines if you want, you know, separate lines. Don't worry about it. We're going to do that via jQuery Mobile and CSS later. So here we're asking for the person to type in a CRN and a class name. And next we'll ask them to type in an instructor's name. So from the same little setup here, we will add another label and input. This one we'll, we'll call this instructor. The third input box will be instructor. Call this whatever we want, of course, to save ourselves some typing. I'll call it inst field. You can call it instructor field, of course, if you want to type that much. Its name is inst field and its ID is inst field. Placeholder, whatever you want. Just put in a last name. Let's say we're only asking for last names. It could be anything, it could be first and last name, of course. Let's just say I'll put in guiding people to put a last name. They can put whatever they want, but this is a bit of a guide. Doesn't matter, of course, but what I can do here is tab these things a little bit just so that they're nice and aligned. Pretty code is nice code. Optional, but here what I've got, so yeah, just a little bit of tabbing right there to make them line up. Easier to read when I have to debug it. Three input fields. <coughs> Nothing will happen here without some sort of triggers. Nothing should happen without some sort of triggers. Simply, for example, buttons. Someone types something. Okay, we'll save this in the database, or delete it from the database, and such. So, after 
those inputs still within the form. Uh, what we'll do is we'll create another input. This one won't need a label because it'll be self-labeled basically. Input type, button. We're going to have a button here. In this case we use value instead of placeholder. And here we will say save class. This is our button to save the class. When they filled in those fields and click this button, in theory, it'll save the class. It needs an ID so that we can write JavaScript. btn add class is, makes sense. This is a button. We'll have several buttons to do several things. This is going to be our button to add a class. The open quote. Well, it's right here. Double quote, save class. Save, you could leave it as save. That'll work just fine. But definitely close that quote. Next line, we'll create another input type. We have a special kind of button called reset. Its only purpose really is to reset the fields. You've probably filled out forms where you're typing a few things in and you want to start over to clear all your form fields. There's a button for that. That's what this button does. If we give it a value, it will allow us to change whatever text is default. For example, clear. This will clear the fields. Let's say, let's say clear fields. This can be anything we want. Of course, we might refine it later. But what this button does is clears the fields. No ID really because we were not going to rewrite its behavior. It automatically simply resets all the fields of this form. It knows which form to clear because the, the reset button is in this form, so it knows to clear these fields. And then last one, another input. Another type. This one will be a generic button. Value show classes. We can do this several ways. The first way will be we're going to have the user save a list of their classes. And then we're going to have them click a button to show their classes. Later, we'll make it a little more dynamic that as soon as they add a class, it shows their classes. But for the moment, to see how it works, We'll have a separate button to show my list of classes. In order for that to fully work, that needs an ID. btn show class. Now right here, every time I teach this, I forget. Show class, show classes, doesn't matter, but we just need to be consistent. This time we'll call it show classes. Because it's probably multiple classes we're showing. So three buttons, save classes, show classes, clear my fields. Nothing really works just yet, of course. We're going to need a few hundred lines of code. Not that many, but we're going to need several lines of code to fully have it work. If we click that uh, save, nothing happens. Show, nothing happens. Clear does work. It will clear your fields. Eventually, I want to display this stuff to the user. So a placeholder would be appropriate to output this on screen. This will now be after our form, after line 16. From 9 to 16 our, are our input forms and such, input form fields. After line 16, we will create a simple div placeholder to display the table of data, to display any class information, to display what the, what the users have saved to the database. It needs an ID so that we can reference it. 
call this div results. Input fields, say show clear, nothing happens yet, no errors should show up. So let's take our second break. I'll put my code so far as is into the network folder. We want this. This is half the puzzle, less than half. This is our input. And we're going to write a bunch of JavaScript now to create databases, store this information that we're asking for as one JSON object, store it to the database, retrieve it, edit it, delete it, all that good stuff. It's 8.17. Let's take our break until 8.27. I'll put this in the network folder, make sure it works, and then we'll go on.